You hear it often said that everyone has to start somewhere. Everybody starts from ground zero, just square one, if you will. And I guess that today's guest is no exception. His name is Michael Harvey Johnson, and he's actually relatively new to the audiobook narration space, but something stood out to me, not just his voice and his ability to deliver as an audiobook narrator, but his ability to actually put together his own sound booth. This is a guy that really learned how to do it himself and really grind it out. So I am just ecstatic to share with you folks a relatively new audiobook narrator. You can actually find his profile over on Audiobook Creation Exchange. I'll leave a link for that inside the show notes. So let's go ahead and let's do a deep dive into how he set up his audiobook narration booth. What were some of the troubles that he ran into? And of course, why did he break into this business? Without any further ado, let's get into the interview. All right, Mike, I am absolutely fascinated by what you're sitting in right now. This is really, really cool. I got to tell you that I'm trying to do my own little rig here for recording audiobooks. But before we kind of get into that room and the work that went into it, what drew you into doing narrating for audiobooks? Because <laughs> I love the sound of my own voice. It's the best <laughs> thing ever, Dale. <laughs> You just have no idea. No, um, when I was a teenager, I wanted to be a radio disc jockey, and I knew that, like anybody knows anything about their future, you just, you know, that's what I'm going to be. And that was my plan until I went to university, as they say up here in Canada, because you don't go to college here, you go to university. Um, sounds better. I don't know. Um, but figured out pretty quickly that being a radio disc jockey, while it might be fun, really doesn't contribute what I want to to the world it wasn't doing anything for anybody um and then on a more pragmatic level didn't pay particularly well unless you were just one of those you know <laughs> Howard Stearns of the world that hit the jackpot as far as just having the right message at the right time and the right personality to make it work most of the folks that work in radio and tv aren't really making that much money um and they're typically kind of gypsies or having to bop around from job to job, which at that time didn't appeal to me either. So made the change to speech therapy. It's been a great career. Um, but there's still something about I, I like performing. Um, I wouldn't say I'm particularly good at it um, when it comes to auditioning for plays and the like. No, I'm not the person that's going to get the lead. Um, but, you know, a uh, character actor now and again. Yeah, I can fill in the blanks. Um, and then when it came to audiobook nar narration, it was just a matter of looking at what can I reasonably set up on my own with my level of um, inexperience and my level of technical expertise, which is, you could argue, is better than the average 60 year old. But uh, nevertheless, you know, as you see, you know, it can be difficult at times anyway so i figured out i could i could make it work um youtube's a wonderful source of information got people out there that can help you out um and uh, as far as setting up an inexpensive sound booth to do stuff it's you know it's not that difficult to do um especially if you do it different than i did which by that i mean i wish i would have asked more people for help than i did um it's just one of the i guess I want to do it myself. So if I were to offer anybody advice, is don't do it the way I did it. You know, ask the people who've actually done it <laughs> and, you know, take advantage of the fact that most people like for other people to be successful. You know, the truly nice people in the universe yeah. are happy to share their knowledge and experience and have other people do well as a result of, you know, the things that I did right or the things that I did wrong. So... Yeah, I, I think you and I share that so much in common that it's like, we'll just do it wrong <laughs> until we get it right and then go, well, we probably should ask somebody. Yeah, <laughs> and and the kicker is I have no excuse because I've met people in my life, you know, a former father-in-law of mine, I refer to him as God because the guy always seemed to have all the answers and it didn't matter what mess I'd get myself into, I'd call him up and even if he didn't know, he would say, well, I don't know, but you could try it, da 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 and in, in invariably something he would suggest would work. And I would marvel at that in my twenties and thirties and you know, how in the hell does he know all this? 
And then I got to my 40s and realized it's because he'd already been through it. He already knew. He'd already experienced either that or something close to it. And those people are just invaluable. You take advantage of that. Don't, you know, like Dale's saying, you know, don't, don't be like us. You know, ask people who actually know. <laughs> and like I say, the truly good people are more than willing, uh, in fact, eager to help you out. Okay, so our, our audio podcast listeners can't appreciate where you're in right now. You're in a sound booth that you've created yourself. Mm -hmm. Take me through the whole process of setting up your own sound booth. Uh, what was the setup like? What was the investment that you put into it? Share all the details. Spare nothing. <laughs> talk and talk. That's what you're telling me to do. All yeah. right, if you insist. <laughs> no, uh, the the first um, incarnation, whatever, of, of Trainwreck was a closet at a house that I was renting. And the room was f literally four foot by four foot. Um, which the advantage to that is um, soundproofing and getting a good dead sounding space, you know, no echo, no real noise at all, um, was easier to do. Uh, the downside to it was it was a closet that was four foot by four foot. And so there was just enough room for the computer, the monitor, the desk, and, you know, uh, a chair. Yeah, it, there wasn't much room and it also tended to get really warm really quick and so i could go for about 20 minutes at a time before i'd have to stop and open the door and gasp and you know just you know god i'm sweaty this is horrible um the advantage of that was it really didn't do any structural changes so if you're a renter you know you don't have the option to put up walls or really to do much of anything so, you know, my solution was to tack the, the acoustic foam that you see in most people's studios um, and then throw rugs, you know, whatever I had handy, you know, I tacked to the door, tacked to the walls. Um, and like I say, you know, I ended up with a, a fairly reasonable dead sounding space. Now, of course, the downside was that wasn't really shutting out any noise from the outside. So if the neighbors, because there was a, a basement flat in the house, and uh, we had a lovely couple that lived downstairs from me that uh, were prone to uh, getting drunk and fighting with each other and slamming doors. Um, and they also <laughs> had a playlist of the songs that they played every time. Um, so anyhow, the point being, you can't really shut out the noise very well. Um, I was in a fairly yeah. quiet neighborhood, so I didn't have to deal with, you know, fire trucks and the like. So it was just mostly the downstairs neighbors that were a problem. So it became a matter of just learning how to time it. Um, there were certain times a day where I could depend on the husband being out and the wife being passed out. Um, so you just, <laughs> you get to, you know, know your limitations. Uh, then I moved to where I am now, which uh, afforded me, you know, it was a new house. And so the basement's unfinished, so I could do whatever the heck I wanted. So I, you know, no nice. basic uh, wood framing of walls, uh, which is, mm -hmm. again, you can look it up on YouTube and see how to do it. It's, you know, measure it, cut it, screw it together, put it up. And, you know, does it have to look perfect? No, because it's just for you. So, you know, you're going to notice things not being square or, you know, things not being quite perfect. But as far as how the uh, room performs, doesn't have any impact at all. You can see, in, you know, in here I've got one yeah. wall with acoustic foam up. But then this wall behind the curtain here is just nothing more than the insulation for the basement. The curtain really doesn't have any effect on the sound it doesn't absorb any sound doesn't do jack all it just looks a whole lot nicer than the pink insulation behind the plastic wrap um so anyhow and then as far as you know the equipment goes i was using my old laptop um it, it's not like the technology that you need is real intense you know it's a fairly simple bit of recording uh software that you can use whether you're using audacity or and I'm drawing a blank on all the others. You would know, Dale, some other examples of the recording interfaces. But again, it's, you know, a, if I can say the learning curve wasn't too steep, then you know it wasn't too steep. It's just a matter of puttering around. And like I say, take advantage. YouTube has all kinds of instructional videos on how to use Audacity and you know, get what you need done. Um, 
and then as far as like okay so that setup wise i think is that does that pretty much cover it all dale's just the other yeah uh what was the costs like for yeah. all of, like the raw materials for <laughs> yeah. you yeah uh yeah i had a budget in mind and uh okay blew that to heck um as you might imagine but not really that bad i think if a person were a little more um uh, if you're efficient at planning out what you want to do beforehand you're more likely to stay within a budget um whereas i had a rough idea and if you saw the the drawings i made they're pretty rough um okay. i think i ended up spending around a thousand dollars between a thousand and fifteen hundred i think somewhere in that neighborhood um yeah. the majority of which was oh the wood and the insulation um when it came to sound treating the room um, up here in canada had canada they have this uh, kind of like a sheet of um, like a plywood shaped sheet and they call it sonopan and okay. it's a acoustic tile it's not super expensive i'm thinking it was like 29 bucks for a four foot by eight foot sheet which i only needed a oh, couple okay. to do because i really only have two walls i put it back in the corner of the basement so i just have the wall in front of me and then the doorway over to the side here and that's it so you know and i did that on purpose um i did want to we had a little alcove in the back of the basement i wanted to use that but technically it's got plumbing back there for a bathroom and lisa didn't want me to steal that space for a studio <laughs> And most generally, I find um, if it's a question between whether I'm right or she's right, I tend to you know take her. So I put it back in this corner. So if you plan it out right, you know you can make it so that you're not having to build four separate walls. You just have to do one or maybe two. Um, if you have the freedom, you know, like I have here, to you know mangle it the house any way you want, then you know you can spend as much or as little as you want but yeah i'm pretty sure we yeah, got between it was minimally a thousand i was hoping to keep yeah. it between 500 and 750 so like i say i i blew it but some of that was just poor planning on my part and lack of experience you know again if i had talked to somebody ahead of time it probably would have gone better understandable now how does it compare from being in this new studio that you've created versus the old closet is it are you able to breathe a little bit better or are you able to stay in there for longer periods of time oh yeah it's for one thing the air conditioning in this house is also the basement's also air oh, conditioned nice. so it doesn't get nearly as warm down here so yeah i can stay in here for <laughs> for hours at a time yeah. i don't because i have attention deficit and that's impossible i can't stay in one room for that long but um from the standpoint of comfort and equipment i've got some room to move around a little bit which if you're doing audiobook narration especially if you're getting into some of the um, more physical characters if you're doing fiction um, you kind of need some room to move because if you're doing a performance it's not a static kind of thing it's just that's not how we talk that's not how people mm -hmm. sound so you've got to have some room to move um no i don't move like that when i'm reading <laughs> yes although maybe i should flapping his arms around am i yeah. Woo -hoo -hoo. yeah nope 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 not gonna do it uh yeah so it's just there's more room it's a four by six room which i know i said the other place was four by four but the way it's arranged is different it just there's like I say, there's more room to move and I can sit, I can stand, you know, either or um, and do it comfortably, which is important because you get into the book reading. If you're not comfortable, it's going to wear your butt down. And if you can't give yourself enough room or way to get like, you notice how I'm sitting here, you know, straight up and down. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not you know, I can't read a book like this yeah. in this position. It's I'm not going to last long. My voice is going to fade pretty darn fast um, you watch any good opera performers and what you will always see is you know, good rock solid bass you know that from their diaphragm on up um and if you don't have that you're you're vocally you're just you're not going to last yeah. you're you're going to find yourself being frustrated um and for those people that really like for me it was more of a hobby but if you're somebody who's really intent on you know i want to make enough money at this that i don't have to get another job 
then you're going to have to take care of these little, you know, nitty gritty things like comfort, um, posture, positioning, all that stuff. Um, so yeah. So yeah, in general, it's a lot more comfortable. Okay. Um, now as far as the equipment goes, yeah. um, so you've talked about the investment of building out your own little whisper booth there. Uh, what about, what is the equipment that mm -hmm. you're currently using as far as, cause you mentioned audacity. So what about microphone, audio interfaces, computer, what are the things that people can look out for mm -hmm. and what are you currently using? Well, currently I've got a, a the um, as far as a microphone interface, I've got the Behringer Euphoria UMC 2020 HD. Okay. Um, most decent microphones, you're going to have to have that interface. Um, you do have some, you know, microphones that have just a USB yeah. plug into the computer, and you get okay. what you pay for there. Um, the quality is going to be, yeah, and you, what you'll find is it's very limiting in what you can accomplish. So you're better off, like I've got the, the Rode um, microphone here that you know, a good friend of me passed on when he yeah. didn't want it anymore. Um, before that, I had a just a cheap uh, Chinese, I think, Neewer, which sounds really chintzy. Actually, yeah. it was a pretty good microphone, and it worked just fine. Uh, between the two, uh, the Rode is a lot more sensitive, and from that standpoint, I have to be a little more you know, conscientious about where yeah. my settings are uh so i've got the interface i've got the microphone i've got the cheap okay. microphone boom if i were to make any suggestions on that one is invest in a decent microphone boom i've got you know basically bottom of the line cheap stuff and it gets kind of aggravating it makes a lot of noise you never really get it in the position that you want i see you nodding your head there. <laughs> you're like yeah i know it all too yeah. well <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean if you don't have a good boom it just you never get it and again it's important to get that microphone in the right spot because if i'm you know, doing this kind of thing, it, it's not comfortable. And again, you won't last very long. Uh, computer wise, I've got, you know, a monitor that I bought off of Facebook off of somebody for 40 bucks. Nice. Um, actually, actually, I bought four monitors for 40 bucks. I didn't know that it, it said, you know, four monitors. I figured it was 40 bucks for one of the four. And I got there and they're like, oh, no, you're taking all this shit. Get it all out of here. <laughs> oh, Okay, I gave one to my brother-in-law, and I've still got two upstairs. If you want, you know, they're, they're you know square, but they they work just fine. I'll come visit you in Canada. Uh, I'll get another. Yeah, one. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hit the road. Uh, and then computer-wise, like I said, I was using a laptop. Now I've got this little mini computer that was hmm. like two hundred bucks on Amazon. Which, from the standpoint of when I've used it for recording for audio book narration, is just fine. Yes. Uh, for being uh for live streaming and stuff like this I'm having a little bit of troubles with it it tends to be kind of temperamental and just randomly gacks and shuts down on me mm -hmm. so you know from the standpoint of did i save some money mm Hmm. is it really cute as hell yeah it's like this you know this big a square about that thick and i've got it screwed to the back of the monitor so it's you know minimal space no sound at all so if you're you know if a computer one of the problems oh. you can have is you know the fans being noisy yeah the upside to this little mini one is the fan on it is so tiny that it, you can't hear it running at all. It's, and if you've got a sensitive mic, that can be an issue. Like I say, it would be fine for narration. I wouldn't recommend it for what we're doing right now. Um, but it could be something I'm doing wrong, too, which I'm going to do some research on when we're done here and see if it has to do with the settings. Maybe I've just you know, got it set up in such a way that that's why it's perpetually going, you know, eh, eh. What do you think is the most common misconception that authors have of audiobook narrators? I have no idea what, what they want. And I guess that kind of you know, hits it on the head there as far as uh, being a book narrator is communicating with that author and finding out exactly what it is they do want. Because it's going to vary wildly um, from one author to the next as far as what they picture a character sounding like. Um, what the dynamics are between the characters and I, as much as possible, I try to, you know, read through it and then find out, you know, do you have any ideas? Because if you do, you know, tell me before I go through. And then of course right. with uh, like ACX, you know, they want you to do a short section of it first and submit it. And the author listens and either tells you, you know, yeah, you're right on target or, you know, mm, not so much. Yeah. Um, but I guess, you know, it's all about the, the communication with the artist, uh, because that book is like a business. It's their baby. Yeah. 
And so it's got a very personal connection to that person. And uh, as an auth, as a narrator, it's impossible for me to guess what it is. You know, I, I can, well, I guess it's not impossible for me. I can guess, but the, the odds are pretty good that I'm going to miss the mark on something. Yeah. Yeah. So communication is probably going to be the key. Uh, rapid fire mm-hmm. for me here. What are your favorite niches to narrate right now? <laughs> Well, at heart, I'm a history nerd. Okay. Um, I figured that out a few years back. Um, so nonfiction, I enjoy. I, I find that entertaining. Um, but, yeah, you know, I've done some science fiction, some fantasy stuff, and I enjoy that, too. I find that to be fun. Um, but, um, yeah, I guess I think I told you, Dale, about an experience where I had a supposed author offer on this you know, PhD dissertation, and it was on some pretty intense material. Yeah. And um, that came back to bite me on the butt. Um, <laughs> it was it was entertaining to read from the standpoint of um, there were times when I knew Lisa was outside listening to me, and you know, I imagine her eyes were kind of because <laughs> it was all about you know how women are perceived in pornography and so it was all these like, <laughs> really raunchy titles of all these different and I, I i tried i did i kept it serious and i went through all that and they end up getting stiffed on the whole deal which um is probably an unfortunate choice of words on, on my part <laughs> for dissertation. Well, but uh, yeah. I was, it really stuck me with that one. Yeah, I, I really, yeah, I really feel like <laughs> this is almost the best note to finish on. But I always like to wrap up each one of my guest interviews with something that I ask them, and that is, uh, what advice would you give to any aspiring authors or self-publishers out there? Mm, authors and self-publishers, you know, again, yeah, that book that you've written is is your baby. And people should respect that and you should have certain expectations, but it's up to you to make sure that your narrator understands what you're looking for Um, and, you know, communicate that. Don't wait for us to figure it out. Tell us what you're looking for. And if we're not hitting the mark, you know, it's like if, if anybody who's ever done any theater or performance knows you get notes. And what are the notes? The notes are what you're doing wrong or what you should change. And so, you know, I think that's a lot of authors probably just aren't accustomed to offering uh, constructive criticism on what we're doing or how we're doing it. And so if you're looking to publish something and you've got a narrator, you know, it behooves you to, you know, don't worry about, I should say, don't worry about hurting. Yeah, I want you to worry about hurting my feelings. I'm a sensitive person. But ultimately, you know, if you're paying me for a service, it, I feel a lot better if I give you what you're looking for. Um, I want it to come out the way you want it to. I want it to be something that you're proud of. Um, Lord knows if, you know, if you've ever written a book, and Dale, I know you have, you know, there's a sense of um, accomplishment that you get with writing a book that you don't really get with much of anything else in life. It takes a certain amount of courage and determination that, frankly, you know, I haven't demonstrated the ability yet in my life. The idea of writing a book is just daunting. I, I, yeah, I get this deer in the headlights look. Reading a book? I'm your man. Writing a book? Eh, I don't want to do that. You've been listening to the Self Publishing with Dale podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingwithdale.com for more information on how you can level up your self publishing business. Also, check out our growing video on demand service, chock full of free and premium content when you head over to theselfpublishinghub.com. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving a review on your preferred podcasting platform. We thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next episode.